Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Singer. Welcome. Great to be here. Uh, I have worked on Pirates of the Caribbean films 2, 3, 4, and 5. I've written three books about the making of those films. Uh, the most recent one is Disney Pirates, The Definitive Collector's Anthology. And I work for the great producer of those films, Jerry Bruckheimer. But we're here today to talk about the incredible 50-year history of one of the most extraordinary theme park attractions in history. And with us today, is an, incre uh, an incredible panel of, of individuals who've been absolutely essential in the creation and the sustaining and the continuation of this attraction. So to begin with, Marty Sklar was still in college when he started working at Disneyland in June 1955, one month before the park's grand opening. He was hired to create the Disneyland News, a newspaper that sold on Main Street for 10 cents during that first summer. He went on to spend many decades at Walt Disney Imagineering, including serving as its top creative leader for 30 years before retiring eight years ago. He was named a Disney legend in 2001, has an honorary window on Main Street USA at Disneyland, received in 2009, and has received numerous awards and honors from the themed entertainment industry. Marty is the only person we know of who has been at the opening of every Disney park around the world, including Shanghai Disneyland, just over a year ago. He's also been active in the community for many years, especially with programs that benefit young people. Marty's influence can be felt at every Disney park's property, and his inspiring approach to creativity still guides Imagineers today. Ladies and gentlemen, Marty Scalaro. Orlando Ferrante worked at Walt Disney Imagineering for 40 years. His first assignment was on the very first attraction to use audio animatronics technology, the Enchanted Tiki Room in 1963. After that, he helped bring several attractions Disney had created for the 1964 to 65 New York World's Fair to Disneyland. He then created a team that specialized in installing attractions, which was instrumental in the creation of Pirates of the Caribbean and several other attractions and shows. His work literally spans the globe, from Disneyland Paris to the development of the Disney Wonder Cruise ship to attraction production for Tokyo Disney Sea. Orlando also has an honorary window on Main Street USA at Disneyland and was named a Disney legend in 2003. Please welcome Orlando Ferrante. Like Marty, Tony Baxter also started his Disney career as a college kid working at Disneyland. Through the years, he has been the creative force behind many beloved attractions such as Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, Star Tours, right, Splash Mountain, and Indiana Jones Adventure. Yes. He was also the creative lead for the development of Disneyland Paris, including Matt Park's Pirates of the Caribbean. He was named a Disney legend in 2013, and that same year he also received an honorary window on Main Street USA at Disneyland. Let's hear it for Tony Baxter. Imagineering runs in the family for Kim Irvine, as her mother was also the Imagineer Leota Toons Thomas. Kim started her Disney career as a painter and model builder for the creation of Walt Disney World. After working on Disneyland Paris, she joined the Disneyland Imagineering team as art director, where she still leads the critical work of preserving and enhancing Walt's original park. In 2011, she became the first woman to receive a prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award from the Themed Entertainment Association. Please help me welcome Kim Irvine.
Luke Mayron has been with Imagineering nearly 20 years. His passion for the future and science have been put to good use in creative leadership roles on Disney attractions such as Mission Space and Space Mountain. He was brought into the Shanghai Disneyland project very early on to help map out initial concepts for the park. He went on to be the executive creative director for Treasure Cove, the first land in any Disney park to incorporate elements of both the films and the Pirates of the Caribbean original attraction, and its own world with other enhancements. Today, Luke is the overall creative executive for Shanghai Disney Resort. Please welcome Luke Mayron. Nancy Ceruto joined WBI about seven years ago. With a deep background in experiential design, Nancy was asked to help conceive Blue Sky ideas for Shanghai Disney Resort. She later went on to help oversee the development of Treasure Cove at Shanghai Disneyland. Leading an interdisciplinary team of more than 100 Imagineers, this all-new Pirates-themed land included one of the most complex attract attraction designs. That's right. Pirates of the Caribbean, Battle for the Sunken Treasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Nancy Ceruto. Well, quite a panel to talk about this amazing attraction and the amazing new attractions. And the first question would have to be, we're celebrating 50 years 50 years of this amazing attraction, the question is its appeal, why it's endured, what makes it so special, um, what makes it so unique, and I'd love to hear from all of you about this. You know, Michael, my, I've always felt that Pirates of the Caribbean really changed the whole theme park industry because uh, it represented the great storytelling that Walt brought to the whole industry. If you think about the amusement parks before Disneyland, they were all shoot the shoots and imagine going, but there are only so many times you could go through the tunnel of love, right? <laughs> so here it is a really great story that is told through tremendous technology and new ways of uh, bringing things to life in an experiential way. And uh, to me, that has always made it the quintessential attraction in, in, in any park. And frankly, for me, I always measured whatever we did against the Pirates of, of the Caribbean here in this. Orlando. Well, the main thing is, like Marty said, is that the story was everything. And then we had a unique way of being able to present it. And it was uh, just very entertaining and it had a lot of surprises in it. That's what made it so successful. Tony? Well, for me, it invites the audience in to be the lead characters in the story, which when I was a kid, that was Peter Pan ride at Disneyland. Only one line in the script, that is, come on, everybody, here we go. And when uh, Ray Bradbury wrote that, he wrote off a little note to the wall saying, I will be eternally grateful for today I flew out of a child's bedroom window on a pirate galleon on my way to the star. I think that's what classic Disney adventures like Pirates do. They allow the guests to get into that pirate medallion, if you will, and, and go into a world that's not like anything we can participate in the real world. So going back to that is constantly intriguing, and that's why we're writing it 50 years later. Kim, your mother worked on the original attraction. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think that um, a lot of it is that it touches on all the senses. It has, uh, you know, it's a little spooky. You have that thrill of going down the waterfall. It's spooky through the caverns. And you get a wonderful sense of humor. It has amazing musical score. And it just has all those senses that make you feel good. No, I agree. I think, uh, the, you know, that, that sense of real and magic, what makes the Disney Pirates so unique? What makes that the attraction, you know, that started all of this? It had everything. The, the fact that it's a real world, but it's magic also, and it's scary and it's funny sometimes at the same time. And to me, that I love that mixture. That that makes me really, you know, have fun. And I, I feel that pirates takes 
guests, and this is the way I feel about it, on an adventure that you just never want to end. It just, it, it's so rich, it takes you in a completely, you know, new world, and uh, I wish it was 40 minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> I go with that. I think a lot of people would agree with that. Let's turn the clock back 50 years, maybe even a bit before, because the attraction had a very, very interesting development, and it's a long story that we probably don't have time to go into in enormous detail, but it didn't begin its life as a boat ride um, or with audio animatronic figures. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit, um, uh, perhaps, Marty and Orlando, of, about the, the roots of this attraction. Well, we had the idea of uh, doing a number of walkthroughs at the time, before, the, before we did the shows for the New York World's Fair, 1964-65. He talked about doing Edison Square, which was going to be a walkthrough of uh, things that Thomas Edison uh, brought to uh, the world, changed the world through electricity, and he was going to do a walkthrough of uh, Liberty Square uh, with uh, some aspect of the Hall of President, which first turned out to be the Lincoln Show. And uh, this was going to be a walkthrough also, in fact, they had actually put steel in where New Orleans is in the ground. But when we went back to the New York World's Fair, for the first time, we were able to um, develop a, a, a ways of moving people with huge capacities. Because before the New York World's Fair, before it's a small world boat ride, a, a typical attraction, if you could get 1,500 people an hour, that was a lot. Here, the, the small world was over 3,000 people an hour. It became the genesis of the way we move people through the pirates. And also the Carousel of Progress, 3,600 people an hour. Huge capacities for the first time. So, so Mark, had, Mark Davis had done many, many, many sketches. In fact, Mark loved to do sketches. He really did. The one I regret that he never did, he had a pirate that was sawing off the leg of another pirate. Uh, <laughs> it didn't work very well in a ride through. <laughs> but Mark loved to do sketches. He probably did 3,000 sketches that, that ended up with what we have in the Pirates of the Caribbean. Orlando, how about um, some of your memories of the earliest? Well, I think the, the, the biggest thing was is be able to do the, the improvements of what, what you see in the pirate ride where we started with audio animatronic. The first, first wolf show that we ever did with the Tiki Room in 1962, and then Walt let us do the four shows with the New York World's Fair. And of those, Lincoln and the uh, Carousel of Pockets were the ones that, that uh, really taught us most about what we need to do and how we needed to improve. Uh, the technicians that we had out of the studio that built all these shows uh, were sent to uh, New York, and they had to maintain what they had built. So it was kind of a double whammy on them. They, they already designed it, they built it, now they had to maintain it. So they came back with a wealth of knowledge of what we needed to do in order to improve our overall system, and which all showed up when we did the fire ride. The fire ride was a totally new system that was designed by these young guys that came back after the experience that they learned. I mean, it, it's almost impossible to conceive of what a quantum leap in technology this attraction was. There were 75 audio animatronics, pirates, 53 animals and birds, 630,000 gallons of water. The technical challenges must have been overwhelming. Well, not the way we looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> we always felt that if uh, that was what the show desired, that's what the designers were after. That's what our responsibility is to deliver. And uh, it was always a challenge, but it was never a challenge that we didn't think we couldn't accomplish. And we always knew that we had to do the best that we could in order to be able to satisfy. If, if I may, you know, um, I think Imaginarian has kept the tradition that Walt started, and that was Walt never questioned any of these. He trusted the people that he had, the talent, to be able to do what he wanted to do. And that's been the case uh, ongoing. And, and, and when uh, Luke and Nancy talk about pirates and Shanghai, you'll, you'll hear that same 
story because it really started with this, the beginning of Disneyland, and Walt never doubted that we could do the things that he wanted to do. He just said, well, I'll find somebody. And you couldn't say no to him. If you said no, he'd find somebody who would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> you still got to clear up one thing for me. I heard the rumor that they had to have a switch in there for the fire department that turned on that fire we just saw in that last time. Did they really do that, or was that just that? Well, it, it, it's a true story that when the fire department in Anaheim first saw the fire scene, they said, how are we going to tell if there's a real fire? <laughs> and they didn't want us to open the, the attraction in the beginning because they couldn't figure it out how it was going to be told. So their problem is to switch it. Does that? Kim, you, your mother worked on the attraction, right? And were you around at all, you know, go to work with Mom Day? Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, she worked in the model shop. She was one of the first women in the model shop, along with um, Harriet Burns and Glenda Von Kessel and Joyce Carlson. And they were building the most beautiful model. Uh, Ken O'Brien and Glenn Gibson were sculpting all the little scale figures. I mean, the, the models that they would build for all of the shows were amazing. And uh, of course, around the house, my sister and I kept noticing things missing. I'd say, well, where did all the bobby pins go? And she said, oh, well, you know, they made the perfect wrought iron railing for the model. <laughs> where are my jacks? They're little Spanish candelabras in the mall. <laughs> where is Barbie's red high heels? Guess where those were? <laughs> so my first, my first viewing of the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean was to get to go to Imagineering, which was wet at that time, and see that model, which was the most amazing thing. It was built uh, up on a riser, right? So you could sit in a rolling chair and roll through it and see exactly what it was going to be like to experience. And uh, that was that was my first time to see Pirates. And now today to be able to, to take care of it and enhance it is really quite a delight. I want to say that those women never shirked from anything that anybody else would do at the mom shop. I remember Harriet Burns was a Texan and she could sling it like anybody, including language. Uh, <laughs> so they, they did anything that was necessary that anybody else could do. It was an incredible coterie of Imagineers, of legendary, of real actual legends, including three of you sitting here, worked on that attraction, but just names have to be mentioned, like Exitensio, of course, um, who wrote the script and the lyrics to George Brun's fantastic music, Claude Coates, Lane Gibson was mentioned, um, Alice Davis for the costumes, costuming every one of those human audio animatronics. Um, just wonder um, uh, what it was like working with them, getting to know them, um, watching it come together at the time, watching this incredible group of people create this attraction. Tony's got a great story about the first time they met Claude. Yeah, I met Claude before I was an Imagineer. I was scooping ice cream. And I would try to sneak any kind of a look I could in anything new at Disneyland on my brakes. So I go over there and I peek through the door that takes you down to where the dungeon is, where the, the dog and the guys in prison, and I peek around the corner. My friend is up at the top of that stairway saying, you're going to get in trouble. They're going to arrest you. And I hear this voice in there saying, you can't see any of it from there. You've got to come down on the track and you can see it much better from here. So I wave goodbye. And for the next hour, this man, who I didn't know who he was, who turned out to be Claude Coates, who designed all the settings. Mark Davis, of course, created all the fabulous scenes that you see, the staging of the characters and the look of their like, expressions and whatnot. But Claude, was the environment of the pirate ride. And so he was very delighted to take someone who was a young student in school, taking theater design, through this and explain all of it. And we sort of dialogued together. I never knew that he'd end up being my mentor, my working partner, and great friend years later. Now, I spent about an hour with him in that ride, and then I ran back to scoop ice cream, and I got docked an hour. <laughs> yeah. I said, you know, I think it was probably the best hour I've ever spent here at Disneyland, <laughs> so you can have your two dollars. You know? <laughs> there's, there's a picture there of Claude and Fred Gerber, and Fred 
was the best at go, at, uh, going into the field and getting what the art directors had designed, what Claude had designed, what Mark wanted for the show. He was absolutely the best. He had the greatest hands, I think, uh, except for Bill Evans, who did all the landscaping and would yank trees out of the ground. Uh, Fred, I mean, they were, just, they were so good at what they did, all of them. If I could tell one story about Blaine Gibson, uh, the sculptor, uh, Mark's drawings, of course, were cartoonish. I don't want to, they're not, not cartoons, but they're cartoonish. And Walt wanted realism. He absolutely wanted these characters to be real. And so Blaine had to figure out how to work between Mark and, and Walt. And I asked Blaine one time because we went to dinner and he was sitting there and all of a sudden we realized that we lost him, he was looking. And I said, Blaine, what are you staring at? The chef had come out of the kitchen and Blaine said, the chef, his hands are too big for his body. And I'm going to remember that for some character I'm going to do. So I said, Blaine, did, did, did that happen often? He said, yeah, my wife, Coral, she developed a technique called kick me under the table. Because <laughs> I was staring at anybody and I said, well, okay, let's carry this a little further. You study people all the time for thinking about characterizations for that you might use. Did you ever do this in your church? And he looked at me and didn't want to answer. And I said, Lane, are there some characters in the pirates that resemble people in your church? <laughs> and he finally said, Yes. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask each of you, beginning with you, Marty, and going right down the line, uh, to tell us what your role was in creating Pirates of the Caribbean and which ones, because there have now been several. Well, my, actually, when we came back from the World's Fair, I had two jobs. One, I rewrote the fourth act of the Carousel of Progress. And the second one, I was uh, writing a script for Walt's film about Epcot and Walt Disney World. So I didn't have to direct working on the Pirates until it came to recording the narration. And I'd done a lot of recording, uh, including of Walt, which I didn't, I don't recommend it to anybody, uh, especially early in the morning. Uh, but uh, uh, I helped Ex Atencio because he'd never uh, directed uh, town and, and doing parts of the Caribbean, so we, we had uh, doing uh, a big show. So we had uh, uh, I can't lost the name. Paul, Freeze. Paul Freeze, who was a great character voice in many Disney cartoons and, and other things. And he did many of the voices in the parts, and so I helped Dex with uh, the recording uh, of uh, voices. Great, well done. Oh, well, I was a coordinator basically on the on the pirate ride. And I, what I learned off the New York World's Fair uh, helped me a lot in being able to work with our designers and engineers and our technical people, developing all the order supply items and things that we're going to have to install into the show and to the ride. So it was a matter of working closely with them and helping them and uh, getting the information from them, compiling the list, making sure that. Uh, these things are all part of the overall schedule and the overall budget in order to meet the, uh, you know, meet the project demand. And it was it was an unbelievable pleasure because I had no basic technical uh, background to be able to work with these people and be able to do something that would help them be able to accomplish their goal. Whether it was the designer or the creative idea or the engineer and how to accomplish what he had to do with the technician or the uh, special effects people or the interior people. There's a lot of things involved with putting a, a show or a ride together or any type of attraction. And it's, it's the pleasure of working with people that, of that talent was the, the highlight of my life. I, I can only think back and say how lucky I was to be able to come into WED what I did. WED was that was an Abel Walters measure back then with Enterprise. And uh, then I came in when I did. And in order to be able to work a lot with these people, it was, uh, it was just uh, something that I uh, continued just amazed that I was able to, to 
be there at the right time. Tony, you've helped bring pirates into a new phase. I did. I, I grew up with the first one, so while they were working, I was sneaking in to see what you were doing. Scooping and ice cream. To me, they built the very best one on that first one. Then we did two more where they had to eliminate one of the waterfalls because we seem to like to build new parks on ground where there's water about one foot down and that denies you from building basements. So when we started the fourth one in Paris, I said, we are going to find a way to reclaim that second waterfall. And the way we did it, we found an old drawing that I believe Herbie Ryman had done showing the boats going up into the fort. And that became kind of a, a storyline change that we really got excited about because it really, if you think about it, we go up the way they haul all of the supplies into the fort. We see the prisoner pirates in, in the jail cell. We see all the boats coming over the ramparts to free the pirates. And then we explode down into the harbor and get into the whole fight. And that put then the ending scene of Dead Men Tell No Tales, because no matter what they do, all the carousing, all the fighting, we all end up the same way. So we put in the treasure and the pirates at the very end. So that was Chris Teague's took a hold of it there and did a fantastic job. So we have a Blue Lagoon restaurant. We have, you know, the, pretty much everything is at Disneyland. And another thing that you guys did on the TV show when you put it on television, they put that, a third waterfall at the end of the ride, right where the guy's got his leg dangling over the edge. So that was where we put that second waterfall in honor of the guys that put the TV show. Um, the other thing that was really important to me was the pirate ride had been built with technology that was state of the art in 1967, and we were now, you know, in 1992. And I said, I want, Chris, for you to come up with something that I would be afraid to do as a human being. And he said, well, a pirate do it with fighting pirates. And I said, yep, that's, that's it. So we literally got these two figures to duel together. Now, they break off an arm occasionally or slash each other's costume. For the most part, it worked amazingly well. And when I stood at the end of the ride, I would hear the, the, the French people like, Mon Dieu, they've got their you know, they, they'd be kind of mining. And so I knew that that had stood out as something that, how did they do it? And I think that's sort of the secret of all Disney things, is to have people come out going, I have no idea how that was done. Kim, you continue a legacy from your mother, which is quite an honor, I'm sure, and also a joy. Um, you have a huge task of maintaining um, very complex technology and enhancements. Well, the, the Disneyland um, Imagineer and Anaheim team is responsible for the care and feeding of Disneyland. And uh, John Hench, who was my mentor for many, many years, would remind me whenever he'd come down, your job is to constantly enhance and keep these rides relevant, to add things, change things always in a positive way um, and, and additive. And so that's what we do during every rehab. We have the opportunity to come in and do a little something new, especially if the ride's going to be down for a very long time. So these are some examples that we've had. Um, a lot of times, going back to Mark Davis's sketches, uh, we'll look at them and look at, at, for instance, here's an example of Mark's wonderful sketch and the um, you know, beach down in the caverns and the pirate that's in the ditch there. And he, he really come to disarray. So we, using the, the rendering, changed it to what it is today, which is an almost exact uh, duplicate of what Mark had uh, uh, rendered. There's also, we have in the uh, Pirates, <laughs> the Captain's Cavern, we thought it would be really fun in his quarters. All captains have a parrot sidekick. <laughs> And he didn't have one, so we did a funny little skeleton parrot with a night hat that sits next to the captain. And then um, the cruise quarters also seemed a little empty, and a lot of Mark's sketches had a lot more characters in there, so we added these two uh, skeletons playing an eternal game of chess down there. And then last but not least, the treasure scene. Through the years, you know, these are, are maintained by lighting people and plumbers and there's all kinds of people walking through those. So through the years, they get a little bit disheveled and just from time, the gold was tarnished and stuff. So we completely gutted this scene, I mean, all the way down to the concrete and 
remade this entire treasure scene. We had our entire office full of leafing every day for weeks. I created this new uh, uh, treasure scene for pirates. And we will continue to add things to the ride as the years go on. Now, a huge addition, of course, Luke and Nancy, you've created a whole new land at Shanghai Disneyland, a whole new pirate's world that you've created. What did you talk about that? Well, we, we came into a bit of a challenge, right, coming after all the incredible creations, but fortunately, we, a little bit of time had elapsed, right, that we were going to open a brand new place, so we took it as an opportunity, uh, you know, to kind of present something new uh, and different, but still hearkening to the original, to a brand new audience. And, and the audience really, you know, going back to Mickey's, you know, uh, Ten Commandments uh, from, uh, from Marty, uh, this audience knew pirates much more from watching the movie than they did from going to the original attractions, because most of them had never traveled and probably would never come to see them. So we, we had an opportunity. We took it as an opportunity instead of a, you know, a fearful thing to try and, and, and bring past there, we wanted to try and leverage off of what they knew and really capture the excitement. Because the, the movies had taken the, the ride into another medium and they were bringing new characters and new stories and all kinds of things to life that were so exciting. And our interest was to like create a high, black, brand new place, brand new adventures with some of the same characters. So you see Jack Sparrow and Davy Jones and so forth, but um, also leveraging brand new technology and all the things that were new and available now, uh, hopefully in the spirit of what you know the original engineers would have done. Um, but really, the goal was to create this time, for, especially for um, uh, Battle for the Sunny Treasure, a continuous adventure that was as intense as a movie that would put you in the middle of the action at the perfect spot, perfect time to see everything happen to you, to be in the middle of the greatest pirate story ever told. Right? That was our goal from the start. Know, gave it everything we had. <laughs> Nancy, huge challenges that you worked on. Shanghai Disneyland and Treasure Cove. Wonder if you could just talk a little bit uh, uh, about, you know, there's cultural challenges as well to getting things right there, working in a, in a different country. Well, I think we, 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 we set off to do something really, really challenging in lots of ways. The scale of it, um, very large scale, the complexity of the technologies, many of which we were inventing along the way, the, the number of specialists and people that had to be um, um, brought together. And, and you know, when you have a lot of very specialized people, you have a lot of different languages you're speaking, even in your own team. And then you bridge to another culture and then you add that complexity. So uh, it, was, it was really wonderful to try and find the common language uh, between all the technology and the artists and the culture we were going into and the, and the people we worked with in China and forming that partnership. I think um, all of that together is, is with the energy you feel when you go through the attraction now. Now there's, there's always been enhancements to all the legacy attractions at Disneyland and Pirates of course is no exception. Tony, you were very much involved with the 2006 changes that brought some of the film's characters into the attraction. Um, there are some changes occurring right now that, um, that's been a little bit in the news lately. Um, and, you know, there's always going to be um, a little bit of... Um, uh, Well, Walt said that Disneyland would always change and never stay the same. Um, Marty, you, 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 you had a few thoughts about that. Well, Walt started changing things at Disneyland the, the day Disneyland opened because <laughs> it, it, when I wrote my first book, uh, it's called Dream and Do It. You can buy a copy here. Uh, <laughs> when I wrote my, my first book, I went back into the Disney archives and I found the comments that the media had made on Disneyland Open. Boy, was I, I was surprised because even though I was there, I didn't even realize how negative so many of them were because things didn't work, the water fountains didn't work because of the plumber strike, 
the on and on, there were so many things. Well, one was not phased at all by, he just said, okay, let's do it and start uh, fixing things. And, but part of it was uh, change, the, the changes that he started to make. And I think, in, you know, being around Disneyland for 60 some years, I can tell you that every attraction in Disneyland has had some kind of change since Disneyland began. And I look at it like a theater show. You know, you come up with a new act uh, for a theater show and it's great. It, it, uh, it's still the same story, but if you uh, brought a new dynamic into it. And, and Walt did that constantly in terms of Disneyland. And he had no well, worry at all about, yeah, and, and, but I, I, I have to say, I appreciate the fact that so many of you came to Disneyland as kids. Then you, you had kids and you brought your kids here. Now you're grandparents and you bring your kids here and you want things to be the way you saw them in, initially. Well, I don't think you want them to be the way I saw them initially, <laughs> the first year. There was a lot of Disneyland that needed to change and got it over the years. And this is just part of the process of the current Imagineers learned that from my mentors, Tony's mentors, their and Orlando's mentors, they, because they were used to that. Walt would say, okay, let's do this, fix this, make it better, come up with a new scene, whatever it happened to be. It's part of the tradition of Disneyland. I see nothing uh, uh, negative about it at all. I see nothing but positive that Disney's thinking about making it. <laughs> Well, everybody has a first time, and um, uh, the first time I remember how my memories of riding pirates for the first time are so vivid. Same with my children, same with my wife. Um, the experience changes a little bit, but we always seem to return to some magical feeling that we had the first time we entered those caverns. I just wondered, the first time you actually rode the attraction, how did you respond? I, uh, Tony, you have a I have three memory. of them. Uh, one was a little bit uh, topsy-turvy for me because I got to sneak on the boats that were being cycled through the ride on the day that Walt Disney passed away. So I was seeing the most incredible ride that would be built in 10 years, but I was also dealing with the fact that the guy I was preparing my portfolio to work for was no longer there. So it was a very strange thing. And I recounted already the second one, which was a walkthrough. Thank you, Marty. I got to actually go on Pirates versus a walkthrough with all the figures running. And then, my sister is in the audience tonight, we snuck into the park for the Spring Fling, which was the first, and it was March 18th or something, the week they celebrated the Easter holiday. And I told her to come out, and when she got up there, the park had closed the ride because something had gone wrong. So we had to stay in the employee cafeteria for an hour while they changed out the day crowd and brought in the night crowd. Now, because it was a sneak, nobody coming to that party knew anything about Pirates of the Caribbean. So we had the whole ride to ourselves all night long. <laughs> because nobody knew what a Pirates of the Caribbean was. It was just a door in a building in Northern Square while they were all running to the Matterhorn and, and all the other attractions. And so that was pretty cool. Orlando, uh, the technology, again, going back to the technology of the ride, not just the audio animatronics, but the special effects. Um, any, any good stories, or any really, um, about uh, the effects of the transformations as the technology has evolved? The fire, of course, has always been an outstanding feature of well, the Well, we had things like Wake Lodgers and Nail Gracie and all these people that were always coming up with unique and different ways of how to, how to present different uh, uh, concepts that uh, the uh, art director was trying to get across. And there was, uh, they were always coming up with new ideas, different ways. And sometimes they would go out there and do little mock-ups that had nothing to do with uh, any show that we were working on for a time, but they were just an idea that they would have, and, and 
then the designers would come by and look at that and say, what's that? And uh, all of a sudden, we incorporated it into a different, into a different show. Yeah. It was developed all, you know, all different ways from the stuff, the way it came. It was, you know, Gracie created the fire scene and many of the effects for the Haunted Mansion. And Walt used to say, he was a tinkerer. And Walt used to say, well, yeah, if I didn't employ you, you'd be home in your garage tinkering. <laughs> and I think he would have been. You know, when we did the Fighting Pirates, the technology you guys had didn't have what they called compliance, which allows the figure to know when it reaches the end of a run. So without it, you kind of react like that. And so the pirates are kept kind of loose. But with compliance, we could do the sword fight and we could take it right to the point where the sword was going to hit. So that was something that technology allowed us to push forward with something that couldn't be done. I was, back in the dawn. Yeah, we went to a, a company called Sarkos that, that uh, built artificial art and stuff. And one of the things that we learned from them was this compliance. And before, our programmers always used to you know, really push it to the, the limit to move the, the figures and stuff uh, as fast as they could. And it was always this problem that Tony said when they come to the stop, especially with hydraulic figures, you, you had a little vibration on you. But with this compliance, they were able to be able to uh, make that move and have it stop and not be able to move again. And it was, uh, it was, it was big, the big, great, big, great thing back in those days. And that was the, uh, the 80s. Yeah, late 80s, early 90s, obviously. Michael, one thing I'd like uh, uh, Luke and, and Nancy to comment on is what really struck me in Shanghai, uh, in the Shanghai attraction, was how seamless the, it was between the built sets and, and the video uh, projection. It's so dynamic and so seamless. It, it, talk about that. The, 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 you know, there's two parts. Like you were talking about technology. One of the things is that we don't, we don't entertain with technology. Technology is invisible. It's it's under everything. It's in a lot. It's in everything that's in the parks. But but one of the best examples was the ride system on, on the parts in Shanghai where these incredibly sophisticated magnets are used to do this crazy dance underwater to move the boat, you would never know. It feels like the boat is alive, it feels like you're on it, and it feels like it's seamlessly transporting you from the perfect place to see everything at every moment. The kind of engineering that's behind this is just absolutely unbelievable. It's just really, really incredible. Our team of engineers, led by Phil Lee, incredible folks. Um, and so, so that's the complex stuff that's underneath, but the artistry of, you talk about the seamlessness of this is, unlike some other rides which try to move you very quickly from one scene to another to kind of make you forget that you're transitioning from one place, we, we took the approach that we were going to savor every moment. We were going to make the transition the show. So when you go from one scene, to, it's all one scene. It's really meant to be a... 10 minute long. And so to make every one of those like tenths of a second just right, we had to sweat so many details. But that's that's the artist with that perfect mix of you know technology, art, and story. And some of the great joy about this team, even though you had rocket scientists working on this project, it wasn't always the most sophisticated tool that got you to the answer. And so we were trying to figure out what does this feel like with the boat moving by the screen and past this scene, and the only way that we could think of doing it was to grab an old broken down office chair and have our special effects guy push us around and try to emulate the boat. And so we we're pretty amusing being pushed around in office chairs, both when we were doing mock-ups here in LA, but then when we got to Shanghai, that turned out to be the best way to do it there too. So, you know, uh, an old chair boat bolted to the ride system with a guy with a stick running us around. That's how all that high technology came together. We used every trick. I mean, you know, it's great because it just reminds me of that we did probably 40 or 60 mock-ups, I forget. And model, endless models, both three-dimensional and physical models, you know, like we've done. And we did a roll through, but we built one on 
you, you rolled through on a stool, and that's the first time I met Michael, now we, with uh, Jerry, we rolled through that, as, and that was the best development tool, because that was physical all around us, but we also then turned that into a completely digital model that we could scrub back and forth like a most modern edit suite of three-dimensional effects all around your media, and, and that's, to me, that's, that's our plan, right? To, to play this giant orchestra, the smartest, coolest, most fun people in the world. But, but here's the key thing. It's not the technology did not drive the story. The story drove the technology. And that is true of any attraction that, that Imagineers do in any of these parts. Story first, and then figure out how to do it. Great stories are what last. Why are we talking about this? It's 50 years. 50 years. That's amazing. <laughs> and Luke and Nancy, let's talk a little bit more about Treasure Cove at Shanghai Disneyland. Um, you paid homage to the original attraction uh, in so many different ways, but um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about a ceremony that you did. Yeah. Um, well, I Maybe just a question. Has anyone been to Shanghai in this, this room? Just show of hands. Yeah, oh, great. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. It might be worth playing a little, a little clip first of the, of the land overall. Just so folks who haven't been here can see a little bit. So uh, we have like a one minute clip that shows a flyover of the land. Um, but yeah, there you go. Give you a, a feel for, for the extent. We built five attractions around pirates. It's just incredible. If it'll play. Here we go. So, it's a giant lagoon and, uh, and, a, and a canoe ride that links this land to the other land, which has its own story. In the foreground of the, uh, the, sun, the ship yeah, on the beach, that's uh, Sirens, excuse me, the Shipwreck Shore, the interactive playground for uh, with water play and all kinds of games for uh, kids and adults. The uh, ship in, at the harbor is the uh, Sirens Revenge, an interactive uh, set of interactive adventures there. The giant fortress houses uh, the main attraction, Pirates of the Caribbean Battle for the Sunken Treasure, uh, as well as the restaurant. So, in an homage to uh, the um, uh, to Blue Bayou, we actually have a, a restaurant connecting to the ride uh, in the first scene. And then uh, there's also a stunchion, extraordinary other story you know, yeah, where pirates actually fly up in the air. And, 30, 40 feet up, and they battle uh, almost right over the audience, and that's the entrance of the main attraction. So, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty cool, but yes, we wanted to make sure that this attraction was uh, properly in the line of all the other fantastic attractions uh, you know, that were in the other parks. We came up with this crazy idea to uh, collect a little bit of water each one of the floats of each one of the rides. We had our secret agent pirates going to all the rides, you know, late at night, collecting a little bit of water. Um, so Kim and I went uh, to actually to the pirates, the original pirates, collected that, and then I made this little case, and we decided to, initially it was gonna be a very small thing, which is, you know, four or five people at night. And, um, and then, you know, as we were starting to organize it, the boat was just, it wasn't even running. We had to push it into place and everything. People started saying, I'm doing what now? Could I go? So by the time, by the time we were doing it that night, we, you know, it was like 30 or 40 people wanting to get in on it. But these, basically the idea was, we brought all the ride into Pirates of the Caribbean, Battle of the Sun, and try to shine high over there. Nancy, I wonder if, oh, sorry. I was going to say, you know, it's amazing, you know, all that technology that we talk about. And we worked on this project for, what, six years leading up before this happened? We went through so many things. It's really, really, you know, extraordinary team. But the day we did that, the night we did that, the, the tone of the entire project, everybody all of a sudden is like, wow, this is real. We really are working on a pirate's a Disney Pirates attraction. It was incredible. <laughs> Wonderful. And everybody around the company celebrated. We kept getting emails. Really, really wonderful. There we are. <laughs>
sneaking down there. Nancy, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of the other technological breakthroughs, because just as the original Pirates attraction was a technological quantum leap, so are the attractions in Treasure Cove, especially Battle for the Sunken Treasure. Whole new ride system. Um, yes, there are animatronics, but there are other technologies which are pretty awesome and completely state of the art. I, th I think the real innovation in the Pirates attraction in Shanghai, it, uh, the technology that makes it all work, the brain that connects all of the seamless experience, was really the most adventurous leap that we took. Because syncing up um, and creating a, a, a ride system that gave you within a millisecond accuracy with media that is, you know, to tie to that motion of the boat, to music that is non-stop. I mean, getting all of that to sync was um, the software and the programming that had to be developed for that. That really was the biggest challenge and the biggest innovation. And that team took a huge leap. And, and that seamlessness is what drives that experience and makes it so thrilling. It never stops because they were able to do that for us. And before you think that all this came together perfectly, I'm not going to tell the story, but I can tell you that Mark Sunder, who's a, you know, he's an uh, engineer, a ride engineer who worked on almost all of the water rides, you know, the last 20 years of the, the, the Imagineering. Early on, when we were doing this, we were also at the same time doing the raft ride for, uh, for Adventure Isle and other water rides. And I went and I talked with them, and I said, so Mark, is there anything I need to know before we go into this? You know, because you know, we're going to be making three water rides at the same time. And he said, you know, when you work with water, water is going to teach you something. <laughs> and, oh man, did we learn? It was incredible. The number of things that turned up in the numbers of ways that water could just wind up everywhere that you could think about, or the boat would do what it what you thought. Or the, and at one point, we had all the water was pooling at the end of the ride. I couldn't even tell why, but it, you know, we had to go back and uh, read things through all that and solve it. Uh, but that was the spirit of the team. You know, there was nothing, nothing was impossible when you have a team like you know, had imaginary. Of course, um, the attraction incorporates and Treasure Cove incorporates so many elements of the film, and I know that on the films, every day all of us felt an unbelievable debt to all of you who created the attraction. Um, we, every day we, we knew that we would not be there had it not been for the ones who created the attraction that the films were based on. Um, it was a great day actually when Exitensio visited. Why weren't you there, Barney and Orlando? We should have been there. Um, <laughs> no, why don't you tell that story? I think it's beautiful. About, uh, about X. About X with Johnny Depp. Oh gosh, when X visited the set, um, uh, Johnny, um, first of all, Johnny did not want to emerge until he was fully attired as Captain Jack. He wanted to meet X Atencio, and he was very excited that day uh, to meet X um, in full character. And, um, uh, and Marty, I think, did, did X say anything to you about that day? Well, there's, there's some behind the scenes stories. One of them is that X had never written a script before, and Walt said, I want you to write the script. That, that was Walt, you know, he took a chance on a lot of us many times. And there was one story I do want to tell, it's a little bit off the Johnny Depp piece, but we had one mock-up of the uh, auction scene at Imagineering before it was all shipped to uh, Disneyland. And uh, we pushed Walt through it, it was the last thing he saw before he went in the hospital. And uh, he was at the level, eye level, so he could see. Uh, what the show was going to be like, and all the re voices were recorded. Got to the end, and X said, to him, Walt, you know, I think I overwrote this. Too much dialogue. And Walt looked at him and he said, no, think of this like a cocktail card. And you go through and you pick up pieces of dialogue here, and something over here, and something over here, but you never get the whole thing. So what? You have to go back. <laughs> I know that, um, when I interviewed X two years ago uh, for the book, and I think he was uh, 95 at that time, um, I asked him how he came up with those incredible spilled cornucopia of words 
for the lyrics for Yoho A Pirate's Life for me, and he said, I got a copy of Treasure Island and a thesaurus. <laughs> <laughs> which, would be, which reminds us that Walt was making pirate things that, uh, long before doing this attraction. First full live action film from Walt Disney was Treasure Island. And uh, Walt um, first is 1927, uh, an Alice comedy, an animated live action film, the first time he created anything with pirates, and that tradition kept on going right through. Swiss Family Robinson did not, the novel, the Louis novel didn't have pirates in it. Walt wanted pirates in it. Uh, Blackbeard's Ghost, which came out, um, actually was released, I believe, either the same year or the year after Pirates of the Caribbean Attraction. Um, first appeared. He definitely had pirates on the mind for a very long time. Um, just have to ask you all, you know, in your conclusion, because 50 years has gone by in a heartbeat, um, is there a personal favorite from Pirates of the Caribbean attraction for all of you? And I'd just love for you quickly to mention if you have a favorite. Well, I always say, I'm, I love, at the end of the fire scene, there's two figures that I love to look at. One is on the bridge and he's got that hairy leg and hanging over. <laughs> and the other is off to the right at that point and that is the pirate with the pigs. Walt with the pigs. And drinking with the pigs. That to me is the epitome of Mark Davis humor and Blaine Gibson interpreting it and Walt laughing like hell. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I, I can't pick one. I, I like them all so much. I don't care whether it's going through the bayou or waiting to go down the down ramp. Did it tell no tales, right? Uh, that's X. Going through the big uh, That's X's voice. Yeah, oh. I tell you, I hope. It, it, the, the whole attraction to me is something that I, I, I it's just too special to be able to pick up one scene or one person or one, or, or one, uh, over to the figures. You know, the, the whole combination of the, of the audio and the, the special effects and the animation, the whole story, I, I like the whole thing. And then 10 seconds or less from the... I love the auctioneer. I've got the original poster that was done by <laughs> Nicholas Collin. And I look at it every day. You know, and it just symbolized the whole ride to me. That, that captured the pose and the, the whole gestalt. Pirates. Kim. I always love secondary characters, and I love Bill with the cat. <laughs> Luke. I love the chickens. I just, uh, you know, I mean, just, that's a story. I just love the chickens. I love the way they dance, and they're just, they're just playing the right like everybody else. <laughs> Nancy. Yeah, I think I don't know what it is about the animals of that ride. They just there there's so much humor in them. I think that's why yeah. they've always drawn me. And we really wanted to capture that too. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, round of applause please for